Welcome to the Practical Futurist podcast, a bi-weekly show all about the near-term future with practical advice from a range of global experts to help you stay ahead of the curve. Every episode answers the question, what's the future of? With voices and opinions that need to be heard. Your host is international keynote speaker and practical futurist, Andrew Grill. Welcome to episode 12 of the Practical Futurist podcast. Today's guest is Julian Fisher, CEO of retail platform GISP. Julian has enjoyed a varied background in technology, payments and new media, and in 1994, he launched the UK's first internet exhibition. Since then, his work has remained linked to the internet and improving sales, payment and issues with compliance, together with information solutions for a wide and diverse group of blue chip companies. Welcome, Julian. Thank you. Now, you told me earlier, back in 94, at the UK's first internet exhibition, a BBC breakfast interviewer asked the question, what is this thing called the World Wide Web? What was your answer back then? Well, back then, the uh, the answer was information. We didn't have many sites as we do today, many of the millions of sites we have today, providing retail products to buy and services. So back then, it was, it was mostly information and it was people trying to connect through dial-up to the internet. So not really product purchasing. That was just beginning to start. It was more information. I remember dial-up well. In fact, in my presentations, I play the dial-up tone, which is actually hard to find. And I let the audience just go... I remember that. In fact, I've been online since 1983 with dial-up on bulletin boards. I was dialing up bulletin boards back in Adelaide. So I think we're probably both internet veterans. Today, we're going to be talking about the future of retail, something you're very passionate about. And we've got to bring the elephant in the room out. The elephant in the room, of course, is Amazon. They've been around for 20 years. And my keynotes, I ask people for a show of hands who uses Amazon Prime. I now actually say who doesn't use Amazon Prime and few hands go up. So question for you. With Amazon so dominant, can the high street be saved? Absolutely. Even Jeff Jeff Bezos said that that his company represents less than 1%, which is quite extraordinary figure for worldwide sales, global sales. But the the high street has got something which the internet doesn't, and that's the ability for you to try something on there and then Mm. and purchase it and take it away with you. So that advantage is something they're playing to a lot. Price is a major factor. We all understand that. But now it's becoming more to do with experiential, actually having more to do, to see, to trial, to experience inside a store. We'll talk about that in a minute because that's probably one way we can bring people back into the store. We, we are seeing major change disappear. House of Fraser, Deadman's, even John Lewis closing down stores. What could these companies have done differently? And for the ones left, what should they be doing now to prevent extinction? Well, of course, the, the one of the main reasons for their problems was that they adapted too late. Everyone knows the story of Blockbuster. Yes. There's one left yep. in, in Oregon. Is that right? Yes, okay. one left. Well, we should all head there now. <laughs> People are. You know what? They actually sell mugs and stickers. But the thing is, what you go there to rent is a VHS tape, and I don't think many people can actually play it. Yeah. And the problem with VHS tapes is that over time, the dust gets in, so yes. you have to get them maintained. So it must be nostalgia than anything else. You're exactly. not going to watch the latest movies on VHS, are you? Well, I did try and find the tape of my interview on the BBC Breakfast for the right. for the trade show, but I found it, but I couldn't find it a player. <laughs> so, <laughs> the high street, with all these shops that are disappearing or have disappeared, they've basically got to adapt to the new market. They've got to pull back on the phenomenal amount of shops that they own. People don't need as many. You don't need to have so many prime positions any longer. You can be out of the city and still enjoy phenomenal opportunities, phenomenal sales. So it's a case of adapting. Looking, looking at your market, seeing what they're looking to buy, where they want to buy them, and meeting those demands, basically. So one thing I saw in the UK happen that Sainsbury's actually bought Argos. And I think that was a really smart move because they now have an online business that, that is quite lean. In fact, I heard the, the CEO of, of the Argos part talk, and he reckons they're able to compete in some areas with Amazon. Do you think that's a, that was a good move for them and what others should be doing? Yes, and uh, absolutely. It, it, it was not considered by many to be a good move, especially after the failed attempt to buy into ASDA. Mm, mm. But yes, it's been a very good move. It has taken people a little while to to get used to the idea of being able to go into Sainsbury's and effectively go into what is a different brand yeah. in the same store. But 
adapting change is something that people will get used to eventually. So yes, it was a good move and it's a smart move. Now in department stores, we would be used to the thing called concessions. For those listening around the world, this is like in Selfridges where you have the Selfridges have the floor space, but you have the makeup counter, you have the handbag counter that are staffed by people from those companies and they almost rent the space. Could we see a Sainsbury's, because at the moment you walk in there, there's an Argos, there's a Timpsons. What I heard the CEO say was they're thinking about you know, how adaptive reuse. We don't need the full 400,000 square feet. Maybe we have a smaller presence for Sainsbury's, but you have other, other people in there, other tenants. Is, is that the mix you think you'll see in these existing sort of big box stores? Yeah, you are seeing that. Whether Sainsbury's will do that is another matter. They typically have owned all of the businesses that are so they've they've got coffee shops they have coffee shops they do have concessions outside the store so Timson's can get your keys cut you can get your shoes cleaned and fixed but actually yes a lot of shops are actually looking at ways in which they can uh, create more opportunities create more reason for people to come into their store so concessions is definitely on the cards of course you've got to remember that that this was very much what Debenhams Yes, do. yes. Um, not so well for them. But the reason f- for that is much more to do with the fact that they were too large, too oversized, without having a focused direction. And they were carrying a large amount of debt. So as a company, they could not get over the debt at the same time as being able to grow the business, which, of course, if you're a young burgeoning company starting out, you don't usually have those problems. So you are actually able to move really quickly to the ever-changing demands of the consumer. So Debenhams is a good example. I don't think I'd ever been to their website, nor would I consider buying something through that website. Were they too late to the fold with an e-commerce solution, whereas the others, John Lewis and others, have adapted and are doing quite well? Well, they, they did have a website. The issues run deeper that, that actually people weren't particularly keen to buy from Debenhams. There were much better offers, much better opportunities, product selection mm. elsewhere. They launched a new logo uh, and they were something that people, in the same way as John Lewis, not so much, but they would enjoy the Debenhams adverts at Christmas. But unfortunately, again, the size of the store, it was just too much weight to carry. Mm. And, and of course, when uh, Mike Ashley kept on stepping up uh, to, demand more changes within the, within the business. This focused their attention in the wrong ways. So I actually remember John Lewis was one of my clients years ago in social media and I was dealing with the people getting their e-commerce up and running. At the time they said that their main flagship store was doing £400 million a year and they wanted their online to do that and more. I think probably it's fair to say their online platform does more than any single store and they almost treat that as a, as a standalone store to, to get people in there. Do you think John Lewis has done a good job of their online strategy? Yeah, they have now. They they didn't at the beginning. John Lewis, I uh, have to be corrected probably, but I think it was ebuy or buy.com. They, they bought into a business. So they were experimenting, which is something that they've always done and they certainly do now. They're a very innovative, creative company. They focus much more on delivering quality of service. Um, Never knowing with the Google's, sold, yeah, the, the price prices, promise. Yeah. 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 But you wouldn't necessarily think to go to John Lewis for the cheapest product yes. but you would definitely go there for the for the quality the variety and for the service so yes. so they have done extreme, extremely well and, and and everyone in the retail industry do look to John Lewis now to to actually get a, t- a temperature gauge as to how well the market's doing so many of the retail magazines online magazines will report sales of John Lewis every week going up and going down so we can see the mood of the consumer in terms of how how much they are heading to the high street to buy in their stores. It brings me to an interesting point, looking at my own retail experience. Recently, I wanted to buy a new 4K television. So I went to Peter Jones, which is near where I live. I saw the television, how it might look on the on the uh, the wall, the size, the, the number of inputs and outputs. I asked a, a man about the, 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 the different options. I then went home and bought on Amazon. Probably actually for the same price. That's what we call showrooming. I know in yep. Australia there have been instances where I think in a camera shop the proprietor said, look, if you want to look at the camera, give me a $400 deposit and you get it back if you buy the camera. But I don't want to have to get it out and show you knowing you're going to go and buy it on Amazon. So are you seeing, are you seeing showrooming becoming a big deal? Showrooming has been around for quite some time now. It's been made obviously easier for the consumer to to use their mobile phones when they're in the store to Mm. actually identify the product. For many years, we've had our clients say that it's been quite cheeky of customers to actually ask them for help to actually find the product on their mobile phones. Oh, wow. To to buy it somewhere else. That's (laughs) really rude, isn't it? But actually, the idea today is is that the consumer is looking for information. They've they've been looking for information since our show back in '94. Yes. But but they're looking 
looking for information to actually satisfy a need, which is to buy a product or to get some more information on a product. So the idea really for the high street retail is to actually meet the demands Mm. and provide that information. While they're there. While they're there. And actually connect with that customer, find out what it is that they are looking for. And if it is possible to meet them with the price and actually find a way to to connect with that customer and say, well, actually, we can give you this right now, 10% off, 15% off. Mm. If the retailer knows their margins well, then they'll know where they can go to in terms of price. Now, I appreciate this sounds easier to say than actually do, but that's where... Uh, obviously, uh, services like our own with GISP, this is exactly what we do. We give the the retailer the ability to meet those demands in real time. But for the consumer, they're going to be doing this, whether the retailer likes it or not. And in fact, when, again, we've asked uh, managers and uh, supervisors and staff, you know, do you do this? Do you showroom? Yes, um, of course they mm. do. And I do as well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as the next person. You'll go in, do a bit of research. And you'll go online, do a bit of research. If, if the product is comfortably cheaper and you're not looking to buy it right now, you will get it from an online supplier. Yeah. It's human nature. A couple of further examples of thinking again to my own retail experience, back to John Lewis. I was actually in there. I needed a tie for an event that night. I didn't have a tie because I'm a futurist. I own few ties. And I found one that I liked. And I wanted to know what the price was because there was no price on it. So the John Lewis assistant literally pulled out his store iPhone, scanned it, told me what the price was and that there were three in stock. And I thought that met an immediate need. The other thing is, and, and I'd love your feedback on this, the whole Apple experience. I look for someone in a blue shirt that has a, a device with them. I don't go to a cash point or a till and they meet my needs. Now, it's getting busier. I know there's a, there's a trick. You kind of hover if you want someone to help you in an Apple store. But they seem to have pioneered this. You know, it's mobile payments. Basically, you, you go and find someone and they get the, the thing out. The Apple experience I haven't seen replicated elsewhere. Is it is this unique or it doesn't work in other environments? Again, unfortunately, this is what we do. <laughs> so we are advocating with retailers to, to actually get rid of their pay desk. Mm, okay. If you imagine you come into the store, you're looking at products. If you're interested, you pick up a product, you walk into an area where selling is stopped. Effectively, mm. the, the pay desk is where you selling is stopped. You, you, you're paying. Yes, I know there's a few products sometimes there, but... Really what we're doing is we're saying you you use the technology like GISP to actually provide the information, the exchange of information, for example, like John Lewis, Mm. how many we have in stock, if we don't have it in stock. At that moment of inspiration, when I'm in, I have a buying signal, I want this now, can you um, fulfill my need? And as you say, you can use technology in the store in front of the client. Yeah, so so what we do is the member of staff will have the phone or a tablet, they're responding to, to a buy request by the customer, they come to the customer, they are able to continue the shopping experience helping the customer. Mm. So this is what Apple have done. They help the customer. Yes. So we help the customer with our application, bringing together two people. This is really important. It's the human element. Mm. So we are a technology company, but very important is that we continue to develop the relationship between the customer and the retailer. That's what retail, high street retail is all about. It's mm. that connection with an individual. The, the worst performing stores are the ones where they've pulled back on staff. They've got no one on the shop floor. Customers are having to find the products themselves. Then there's no one around to help. So we are saying if you get rid of the pay desk and you put your staff on the shop floor and then you connect with them through the application so they've got all the information, they can they can do what's called endless aisle, they can check to see if there's products available in other stores. If I want to buy the product, I can then have it shipped to me or I can have it delivered to the store or I can come back later that day. These are the processes. These are the solutions that we're we're saying to the high street. They're available to you right now and they could help you save your store, quite literally. I imagine that your job is made a lot easier by the whole Apple thing. You say you want want the Apple experience. Well, this is what you can have. You just need the technology. Then you need to train people, as you say, to come back from the cash desk and be wandering the floor. I keep picking on on John Lewis' partnership at Waitrose. I've been in the UK now 13 years. I remember I went to to find something that my wife had given me to to find on on a a, picture. And the person dropped what they were doing, walked me across the store so I could find it. And I didn't know why they did it until I worked out that they are partners in the business, literally. And so if I stay there and buy that, they get you know a benefit later yes, on. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's all about customer service. And this is going back to what you've been saying about Amazon. Jeff Bezos has done incredibly well. He's, he's, he's made the company focused on 
the customer. That's the number one priority. So we're saying the same thing. Focus on the customer. Get the information to the customer. Help them with what they're looking to purchase. Stay with them. You can actually complete the transaction immediately where they are. So what we found is by by working with the customer with the technology, the sales go up. They mm, actually spend yeah, more money yeah. because actually I'm being helped, I'm being looked after, and I can then see what other products you have. And and who knows more about the products in the shop than the staff? Not yeah, me. Yeah. I don't know about your products. The staff know about the products. The technology then helps the staff connect all the other information we need. I was reading on your website an article where you talk about retail retailtainment. What is it? And why might it be important to get people back into stores? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's just retail and entertainment merged together. It's about this requirement for the retail industry in the high street in particular to find more ways to encourage people to come into the store, to be entertained, to get an experience, an experiential experience, mm. as they're, they're calling it as well. So you'll see this in places like Primark, the new HMV shop that's also opening in, in Birmingham called The Vault, same thing, where they're actually trying to bring more entertainment into the experience. Now, you may end up not buying anything, but you probably will, mm. because it's kind of like when you think about the, the shopping centre, what is the shopping centre doing? Well, they're putting on entertainment, they're putting on food, they're putting on places for you to sit, to rest, to park your car. So they're making it an experience. So you're coming to a an, an, an whole venue full of different things. The store is now replicating that. Yes, so yes. they're now saying, you can come into our store, you can get your hair cut, you can listen to a band, um, you can try the product. They're even, you suggested, you, know, you can take away the product, have a play with it, see if it works, and then bring it back if it doesn't. So they're giving you every opportunity to buy products. And again, Apple have been doing this with Today at Apple where you go in there. And I suppose their rationale is once I bought the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple Watch, there's nothing else for me to buy until the next time they release a new upgrade. I've got to have a reason to come back. And I've actually did, I did an iPhone photography course around Covent Garden to take better iPhone photos. It was completely free, but I now am hooked on the Apple product because my, yes. my need was met. I need to know how to use it better. So my friends think I'm a great photographer. And it, when you think about what the Apples are doing and what Westfield are doing to bring the people in, yeah. it, it's just common sense. But I think maybe the high street of today is locked in the high street of old and they don't understand that it's got to be an experience that they're brought into. They may not buy on that first trip, They'll come, but if they come back the second time, you want to make it easy for them to buy something. Yeah. I mean, you know, for yourself that when someone is helpful, you will always go back and talk to that person. Mm. And if you find someone who's not helpful, you'll tend to stay away. So if you manage to find a store that's helpful to you, that's actually giving you something, even something for free, you'll go back or you'll recommend it to somebody else. Of course, else. yeah. And of course, during the time that you're being helped, your defences are actually lower and you are thinking about maybe, yes, I will buy that because this person has been mm. really helpful and I want to reward the shop. So you're, you're actually giving yourself reasons why you're going to buy the product. So interestingly, many stores could, in some instances, more than double the transaction value. And that's what we've seen with our customers. They, right. they, they, they get the information, they help them, they're with them for the whole process. So they're not just saying the product's over there and then you've got to find the pay desk. Then they're staying with the customer. They're helping them through the whole process. They're adding products to the basket. The customer's then paying for it themselves where they're standing. Yeah. There's no need to queue. The product is bagged. It's a personal service. And then I'm out the door. What an experience. I'm going to come back. Yeah. I know you do a lot of work in the hospitality space. And with the rise of delivery apps, I've seen this impacting the industry in a variety of ways. Some are relishing extra business. The, my local 24-hour restaurants say they're doing £2,000 a night extra because of the delivery services. And some are opening dark kitchens or delivery-only sites. But if the dining out experience, back to retail, is being eroded by these delivery services, can we get people back into sit-down restaurants? Yes, we can. And the reason is, 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 in fact, very similar to the cinema industry, which I used to work in as well. So, obviously, with the growing equipment, the, the new fantastic equipment and flat screen TVs and great sound systems, and, of course, you've got a great sofa and you've got your microwave for your popcorn, you know, why would you want to go to the cinema? So, the cinema fought back with 
greater choices of films, fantastic seats. You might say that their prices weren't particularly brilliant, but you know they've done as much as they can to create a welcoming experience because, of course, you can now watch everything and there's so many opportunities to stay at home. So with the food and the hospitality industry, it's, it's very much the same thing. They want the business. So whether the kitchen serves up the food and you come and collect it or it's delivered to your home or whether you sit in mm. the restaurant itself, to some degree doesn't really matter because it's business. Mm. They're taking money. And yes, it is a changing environment that we're now seeing kitchens that probably don't have anywhere for you to eat because they're just basically cooking the food for your takeaway. Yeah. Or the dark kitchen. I think what Deliveroo and others have done is actually dumped containers which are fitted out with the full kitchen. And so you can't have a meal there, but it means that this high-end restaurant that would never open a store there has a delivery node that they can actually do yes. the, the motorbike yeah. deliveries yeah. from. Yeah. So I, I, I welcome it. I think it's, it's giving the customer more opportunity to to experience some great food, some different food that they may not. And if it's a delivery service, it might actually even be a little bit cheaper than, than having to go and sit down. Of course, what it will lower is the, is, is, is the consumption of alcohol. So if you're buying alcohol for your meal in the restaurant, you won't be with a takeaway service. Mm -hmm. But people are still going out they're still sitting down. There's still reasons to, to, to be away from the home, be away from the kids. And again, it comes down to the restaurant's ability to serve a great um, experience as well as great food. Yeah. Obviously, you're in the thick of it in terms of technology in this retail and hospitality space. But what are the latest innovations you're seeing in these industries? Well, a lot of AI there is some augmented reality as well, but actually AI is that silent piece of technology that is working in the background, that's creating great connections, understanding better my needs. Some people are saying, well, of course, it's a little bit like Big Brother. You know, I'm, I'm not aware of what's going on, but things are being presented to me. And I'm like, wow, you know, I was only talking about the other day. How do they know? But there are, there are reasons for this information being found out. So it's up to the, the uh, Information Commissioner's Office to actually protect us, to make sure that companies are doing the right thing with the data. But companies like ours are using information to create a better experience, to create better connections, to give the customer more of what it is that they're looking for. And they're wanting it. They're wanting that. But at the same time, what they want is to know what's happening. So retail, like some of the other industries, are stepping up to the information declaration so that you know why this information is being asked. You're being given the opportunity not to have to give it. So AI is one thing. You're also seeing companies create opportunities to show you the products on large screens in the stores. There are ways like our technology where you can tap on a product or on a sticker and the information is immediately in your phone. And again, in similar to ways, to, again, Amazon, Amazon Go, we provide a solution where you can walk into a store, tap on a sticker, taking the product and walk out and the product is purchased instantly as you leave the store. So we're giving the convenience back to the consumer and we're creating new opportunities for retail to be able to provide that extra level of convenience to their customers. So, so it brings me to my future view. What will the high street look like in five or 10 years? Uh, it sounds like with AI there and with the technology you've mentioned, there won't be any tills. Will we just be going in and going out and not stealing things? But it, it, <laughs> I, I still would be feeling very uncomfortable walking in and not actually paying for it unless I knew that it had actually registered all the things I had. Is that the future? Fr yeah, well, frictionless shopping. Yeah, so definitely, yeah, frictionless shopping, autonomous shopping is another way they mm. describe it. The reality is is that to start with, we, we will be a little bit uncomfortable and, and, and some people, you know, are saying, well, uh, when I've, when I've uh, had this service, I, I want to show my phone to say, look, I've, I've bought or in the days when we first stopped having uh, bags available to us free of charge and people walking out of grocery stores with their, with their trolley full of food because they didn't want to buy a bag mm. and security <laughs> in the old days would be, you know, stopping it because if you didn't have a bag, it yeah, was you've stolen most likely it. Yeah. stolen but we do change. We do get used to the change. As for the high street, it won't look a, a lot different. Really? Um, Physically, in no, terms not, of a, no. a, a frontage and there's a door and a window? and It will all be the same. It's, yeah. it's slow to change. The, the, there'll be certainly fewer pay desks mm. for certain. Cash will still be around, even though there's a lot less demand. 
But the chances are that, that the government, as, a, as many governments around the world have done, will, will, will force retail and other industries to accept cash. So it'll still be around for a while. What you will see is more people going into stores and shopping with their mobiles mm. in the store. And actually people will, will actually be communicating with and, and working with the, with the retailer with their mobile phone. And the retailer might have a tablet or their own mobile phone. So that's what you'll see. But the physical... Appearance of stores will not change. You don't think there'll be more of a mix that you might walk past a store that is actually a grocer, a, a supermarket, a coffee shop, a bookshop, a pickup for Amazon. You don't think there'll be a mix in those physical units, or yeah, well, there'll, there'll be some stores that will have that. There's been discussions and calls for retailers to get together to try and create collection points so that they can fight again, fight back, and mm. have their own. So the, there's the all click kinds and collect of type yeah, of thing. Exactly. Yeah. There's all kinds of opportunities, but but I think when we think of what does the high street look like, it will still look the same. It's just the services inside will just be a little different. And from what you said, they'll be enabled by technology, some that we'll be able to see and some that we won't be able to see. Exactly. Yeah. So as this is the Practical Futurist podcast, I've got to ask you for three practical tips that you can give our listeners for things they can do next week if they are retailers or even if they're consumers. What can they be doing to get ready for this new digital world? Okay, well, the first in common with what we do as a company, look to your staff, look to people, talk to your customers, talk to your staff. They, they are members of the public too. So as I said, you know, when, when I shop, I'm like any other shopper. So my habits, the way I, I shop, the things I look at, the way I go around looking for products and buying products is something that everyone else is doing. So, so we're no different. Talk to, your, talk to your staff, talk to your customers. Second is be bold and innovative. Be prepared to fail fast. This mm. is important. If you don't create opportunities to innovate and find new opportunities and then learn to give up on those opportunities if they don't work. In other words, don't keep going just because you started. If it doesn't work, fail, move on, do something different. The companies that have stayed the same status quo, they're the ones that we either are not seeing today on the high street or we they are the ones that are struggling. Mm. So keep moving, keep innovating. And the third um, is really make your customers the focus. You've got to make your customers the number one priority in everything you do. So again, going back to our dear friend Jeff Bezos, he decided long ago that the most important person, the most important part of his business was the customer. I appreciate that many would say, well, it should be your staff. But in terms of for the business, he was thinking more of his customers they're the focus and and of course we can see that that has been a very successful mantra for him absolutely and i think everyone looks for amazon they fear them but they also think they've done amazing things julian how can people find out more about you and your work thank you well we we are like most we're available on the web so www.gisp that's J-I-S-P, yep. as in Lisp, but with a J. Yeah, exactly. So gist.com, and we have plenty of videos and um, white papers and, and research and showing exactly how we've done the work we've done, who we work with. Yeah, and it's a very exciting time for us. Julian, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Practical Futurist podcast. You can find all of our previous shows at futurist.london. And if you like what you've heard on the show, please consider subscribing via your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. You can find out more about Andrew and how he helps corporates navigate a disruptive digital world with keynote speeches and C-suite workshops at futurist.london. Until next time, this has been the Practical Futurist Podcast.